Uh, I'm Barry Goff, uh, biographer and historian, a lifetime member of the Maritime Museum of British Columbia. And I want to read from my book, uh, Possessing Mirrors Island, and talk specifically about Wiccaninish, Chief Wiccaninish. As presents, Mirrors gave Wiccaninish six brass-hilted swords, a pair of pistols, a musket, and powder. This sealed the relationship. He also gave him a fine suit of clothes for the elders, for the chief's brother, and only did the trading commence. Mears offered other items, and in return received 150 fine sea otter skins. All had to go through Wick and Inish. Property was the key thing here. James Cook, 1778, had noted in his journal that everything had to had value to the Northwest Coast peoples. There was not a blade of grass that had not a separated owner, so that I am very soon emptied my pockets with purchasing. And when they found I had nothing more to give, they let us cut wherever we pleased. Here I must observe, he says, James Cook, that I have nowhere met with Indians who had such high notions of everything the country produced being their exclusive property as these. The very wood and water we took on board, they at first wanted us to pay for. Now he's specifically referring to the New Chalmers peoples. The trading press process exasperated James Cook. Not only did these people place highest regard on property, they also had an almost obsessive concern over property inheritance of titular rights. And they were much more historically minded than most primitive people, says one historian, and they maintained reliable oral traditions extending back over many generations. So that we can also assume, says the same authority, that the way of life the early explorers encountered must have existed unchanged for at least two or three centuries preceding their arrival. There's little to quarrel with here, for cultures rarely take radical departures and cleave to old ways as long as they can, even clinging to ancient ways of historical understanding and homiletics or rhetorical patterns. Mears found Wiccaninish a tough bargainer, and he even says that he was probably duped in his, by his trading practices. He doesn't say cheated, only duped by their cunning. That is, he was outsmarted. Perhaps he was expecting something of an easier arrangement. As well, time was on Wiccaninish's side, for sooner or later his mariner visitors must depart and he knew that they did not want to go away empty-handed or with insufficient cargo for a profitable voyage. As to the people of Wiccaninish village, Mears thought them superior in industry and activity to those of Nootka Sound. Thus it was that this little-known place, the land of Wiccaninish, the chief, the village, and the waters in and around Mears Island, was written into the European record as something different from Uquat and Nootka Sound, a place apart, one less traveled, but one dominated by astute traders. Mears had no trouble with these people. He admired them. He mixed easily with them. Others, as we will see, had different experiences. Before closing, we need to t make one observation of importance. Cook called Nootka Sound King George's Sound. This locale, put on the chart authorized by the British Admiralty, soon became the rendezvous of shipping in these latitudes. As a place of rendezvous, ship repair, trade, and so forth, it holds pride of place in coastal history, and indeed, in the history of the Pacific Ocean. One could imagine somebody in London, England, or Sydney, Australia, looking at the Pacific and saying, aha, Nootka Sound. They aren't likely to say, aha, Clackwatt Sound. 
However, and this is the central point, by 1792 the great collections of furs were not made at Nootka Sound, but rather at distant locations such as Clackwat, Prince William Sound, Queen Charlotte Islands or Haida Gwaii, Nass River, and Cape Classet near Cape Flattery. In other chapters in the book, we talk about Clackwat. In, in the view of the Spaniard Mazzino, Nootka only attracted foreigners because they could ply them, supply themselves with water and firewood at no risk. It was also a place to gather news of ships coming and going and of international affairs swirling around the sound. Outsiders had to come to possess island, the Mare's Island, and adjacent waters as a trading realm, a place different from Nootka, a place important in its own right, a destination, a collection place and a location at which to barter away the trade goods of the world for the sea otter king. Now one wonders how long this would last. <laughs>